Well, here we are again this morning attempting to uh, start taping and get ahead for the second um, testing period in the course. We talked in the first quarter of the course about Spanish Texas, uh, Mexican Texas, and then Texas in the 1836 revolution that ended with the, quote, glorious victory at San Jacinto. But the truth is that uh, for this first lecture, of the for the second test talking about independence in 1836 meant uh, many different issues and many different problems for Texas first of all there was the fate of Santiana what what to do to, the, to do with that guy and to that guy who had killed so many Texans at the Alamo and at Goliad secondly what would be the finances of the new Texas state government national government, excuse me, because the Republic of Texas was going to have to be able to provide for the defense against the Mexicans, against the Indians, etc., and it had no revenue stream. But it was going to have a very solid expenditure stream. How could funds for the new government be found? A third issue that is, was on the minds of many uh, new citizens of the Republic of Texas. How to, to prevent how to prevent reprisals by the Mexican national government because Mexico new government disavowed what Santiana had promised at the Battle of San Jacinto or afterwards and immediately disavowed him claiming that anything that he had agreed to under coercion was not legal and that that uh, in truth the new Mexican nation state and government felt that uh, they'd be perfectly happy if the Texans executed Santiana because probably he would be either exiled or executed if he returned to Mexico. Then there was a fourth issue. How could the Republic of Texas hold down the annual Indian depredations on the frontier, on the frontier line of the Republic of Texas? Most citizens lived east uh, in, in what is today called East Texas from the Sabine over to about uh, oh, uh, the Colorado River uh, where Austin is today and very few Anglos lived in the Rio Grande Valley. The, in truth, the valley was susceptible to raids from Mexico by Mexican soldiers and the frontier line was completely indefensible against the Comanches and the Apaches they were going to go on annual, annually on the warpath. And so great problems existed when Texas became independent. You know, there's an old saying out of Southern history, don't hone for something because you might get it. And in this case, the Texans had honed for, they wanted independence. But with independence came responsibility. And uh, that responsibility of dealing with the Indians, with Mexico, with finding finances about what to do with Antonio Lopez de Santiana was going to be a real problem for the new uh, government of the independent Republic of Texas. David G. Burnett, the provisional gov gov uh, excuse me, provision provisional president of Texas, set forward the first national elections from December 1836 to September 1836, <clears throat> and there were three issues to be decided in that September 1836 election. One, ratifying the ratification of uh, 1836 National Constitution for the Republic of Texas. Two, the election of officers, assuming that the people would agree to independent status for the Republic of Texas. And three, whether the, the very the ensuing Texas government of elected officials elected in September 1836 should immediately seek annexation with the United States of America. Ratification of the Constitution and, and interest in U.S. annexation was of little doubt, and people knew that that's what the Republic and her citizens wanted. The question was, who was going to be the first president of the Republic of Texas? There were three major candidates. Henry Smith, the provisional uh, gover governor of Texas during the 1836 revolution. <clears throat> Stephen of Austin, the father of Texas. And Sam and Sam Houston, 
the three men declared for the presidency of the Republic of Texas. Houston arrived back in Texas just 11 days before the September election, having uh, returned from New Orleans where he had undergone very delicate surgery on his ankle in an attempt to remove bones and fragments of the Mexican bullet that had shattered his ankle at the Battle of San Jacinto. But in the final analysis, it wasn't much of a race because Sam, Sam Houston, sometimes now being referred to in 1836 as old Sam Jacinto, the hero of San Jacinto, Sam Houston won easily 5,110 votes to Henry Smith's 743 to Austin's 587 votes. Um, the question was, why a 10-to-1 victory over Austin and 7-to-1 over Smith? Well, probably Stephen F. Austin had been late into the game of uh, <coughs> supporting annexation for, I mean, supporting independence, um, total independence for Texas from Mexico, and Henry Smith uh, was just the provisional governor, but Sam Houston, after all, was the hero of the Battle of San Jacinto. So overwhelmingly, the American, the American, the uh, Texas citizens elected Sam Houston as the first, first president of the Republic of Texas. Mirabel B. Lamar was elected in the same election as the vice president of the Republic of Texas. And the voters overwhelmingly supported the 1836 National Constitution for Texas and signaled a clear intent that Texans wanted to be annexed into the United States of America. That wasn't going to happen for a while because of resistance in the North in the United States Congress. But not surprisingly, the, the uh, New Texas state was primarily Anglo-American in its way of life and orientation. Predominantly Protestant and English-speaking, the Texas government had a Republican, little or Republican form of government, representative uh, democracy, and it was based on federalism with separation of powers in three levels of government, national, state, and local. And uh, the Texas Constitution had uh, specific personal liberties uh, stipulated in it, and uh, the leadership of the new Texas state, na nation state, came from uh, right out of the United States political traditions. Houston had been a United States senator and uh, uh, from Tennessee, a governor of that state, Tennessee. Lamar had served in the Georgia legislature. Stephen F. Austin had served in the, in the uh, Missouri territorial legislature, etc. So when David G. Burnett resigned in October, October the 22nd of 1836 to facilitate the the coming of the new government. Um, Sam Houston took the oath of office and immediately placed into government his two chief rivals for the presidency. Henry Smith was given a position of responsibility and Stephen F. Austin became the first Secretary of State for the Republic of Texas. Austin died two months later, um, uh, very, very uh, suddenly, and he was replaced by Dr. Robert Orion, I.R. I O N, the first president of the the first president, the first Congress of the Republic of Texas, created twenty three Texas counties. By the time that Texas was annexed into the United States in eighteen hundred and forty five, that had expanded to thirty six Texas counties. But most importantly, on December the nineteenth of eighteen hundred and thirty six, December the nineteenth eighteen thirty six, the first Texas Congress passed a law defining the boundaries of the Republic of Texas. And not wishing to scrimp or short thrift themselves, the, the uh, members of the first Texas Congress declared that the Rio Grande border, the Rio Grande River, was the appropriate border between the Republic of Texas and Mexico. That was a stretch because there were virtually no Anglo-Americans, no Texans, citizens of Texas, um, English-speaking Anglo-Americans living in the Rio Grande Valley. But on the basis of that claim, the United States would later annex Texas and claim the Rio Grande River as the border between Mexico and 
the United States with Texas as part of the United States. The same law of December 19, 1836 authorized an army of 3,587 troops with 280 mounted rangers. And it called for the enrollment of all able-bodied men in Texas from 21 to 50 years of age to prepare a, to drill and prepare a militia to protect the frontier against the, potentially against the Indians, bandits, and threats of Mexican army invasion. President Houston soon quarreled with the Texas Army over his release of Santiana. Houston finally sent that gentleman, Santiana, to Washington, D.C. to encourage Andrew Jackson and the Congress of the United States to annex Texas in return for his freedom. The Texas Army commanders also wanted to attack Matamoros, and they were not pleased when Houston uh, did not wish so because of financial reasons, and Houston named Thomas Rusk as his Secretary of War. When Houston appointed uh, Albert Sidney Johnston to take overall direct Army command, the troops backed Felix Huston, H-U-S-T-O-N, who um, challenged Albert Sidney Johnston to a duel in severely wounded Johnston. Given Sam Houston's interest in fiscal, uh, fiscal, fiscal responsibility, that monetary responsibility, Houston, in May of 1837, furloughed all but 600 of the Texas Army soldiers, offering those who were furloughed either free passage back to New Orleans, Louisiana, in the United States, or 1,280 acres of free land to settle in Texas. And so uh, he greatly reduced the size of the Texas Army to prevent a conflict with Mexico uh, and to save money. But the reality is that when Houston left office in 1838, since the first elected president of the Republic of Texas was to serve a two-year term and all others, non-successive uh, elections would be three-year terms of office. So Houston's first term was only two years. And um, when he left office, the public debt was $2 million, despite his best efforts. In order to protect the, Ameri the Texas frontier, in May of 1837, the Texas Congress authorized a corps of Texas Rangers, including men such as Rip Ford, John Coffey Hayes, Sam, Samuel Walker, Ben McCullough, and Bigfoot Wallace to defend against the Comanches and the Kiowa Indians, who constantly raided every year. In one of these raids on the Texas frontier, Cynthia Ann Parker, a young woman, was taken and she eventually became the bride of a Comanche war chief, and their son, Quanah Parker, became the greatest and the last major Comanche Indian war chief in Texas. In East Texas, in the summer of 1838, Vicente Cordoba, a Mexican agent, led a short-lived rebellion of 600 East Texas Hispanics and Kickapoo Indians against the Republic <clears throat> against the Republic of Texas. So Houston Houston had to put down that revolt. While he was president, Sam Houston wisely wisely um, protected the East the uh, East Texas Cherokee Indian tribe and protected their rights, but he could not uh, continue to protect their rights when. Uh, Lamar became president in 1839. But the reality is that uh, the government of Texas was in terrible financial shape. In 1838, Vice President Lamar opposed Houston's policies, and Lamar hated the Indians, and he hated, Lam uh, hated Sam Houston's benevolence, particularly to the Cherokee Indians. Lamar criticized Houston's inability to, um, to inability to get Mexico to recognize the independence of Texas and uh, also for his inability to get the United States government to annex the Republic of Texas. When no viable anti-Lamar candidate 
emerged and when two Houston supporters in very separate, unrelated incidents kill themselves, then there was no opposition to Mirabeau B. Lamar. And he swept into power very easily, becoming the second president of the Republic of Texas with David G. Burnett as the vice president for the Republic of Texas. Houston was infuriated that he would have to give up control to Lamar because he knew Lamar hated the Indians. And Sam Houston was, of course, an adopted son of the Cherokee tribe. So in, uh, in, at Lamar's inauguration, it was traditional, out of the Anglo-American tradition, uh, when American presidents are inaugurated, the outgoing president have, speaks first and, and you know, takes the opportunity in a short speech to thank his supporters, etc. But Houston was incensed. He knew what was coming with Lamar. Nothing good as far as he was concerned. So in order to embarrass Lamar, Houston's farewell address droned on for three solid hours. And by the time that Mirabeau B. Lamar was inaugurated and, and was prepared to give his speech, he was absolutely livid and could scarcely talk because he was so upset with Sam Houston. Lamar as president, 1839 to 1841, was committed to the independence of Texas as an independent nation state. He didn't want uh, annexation to the United States. He wanted to remain an independent republic. He was a strong supporter of public education, and he urged the Texas Congress to set aside land for schools in every Texas county. And um, he set up the foundations of, of education in Texas, and indeed he is called the father of, of Texas education today because of his undying support for public education. He also supported the passage of the Homestead Law in, in January of 1839, under the homestead rules in Texas, if you have financial difficulties and you cannot pay your bills, the government can step in and assume your, your assets and forcibly pay off your debts. But the one thing that government cannot do is to sell your home out from under you, even if you are heavily in debt. That is the homestead law that protects one's home, one's homestead. And that comes out of the, out of the Hispanic tradition. There's nothing in, in uh, Anglo tradition that suggests that uh, one's home could be, be protected. But uh, out of our Spanish tradition and heritage came the Homestead Act of January, January the 26th of 1839. The selection of a permanent capital was something that weighed heavily on Lamar's mind because when Houston was president, the Allen brothers had created over, uh, over near San Jacinto a little sleepy village called Houston, and it was the first national capital of the Republic of Texas. But East Texas, including the Houston area, was heavily supportive of Sam Houston, and Lamar, of course, opposed Sam Houston. So in order to uh, move the capital, uh, Mirabeau B. Lamar convinced uh, Congress to set up commissioners to search for, an, for a permanent capital for Texas between the Colorado and the Brazos River and north of the old, um, old uh, La Bahia to East Texas Trail, the old Spanish Trail into East Texas. And in 1800 and... and uh, Forty, in 1840, that, uh, that commission of the legislature identified a little sleepy village on the Colorado River uh, called Waterloo. And Waterloo eventually was uh, changed its name to Austin, Texas, to honor uh, Stephen F. Austin. And Austin, out on the Colorado River, was uh, literally on the Texas frontier. And it was heavy Lamar supporting, and so Lamar, Lamar convinced, and and the people of Texas voted that Waterloo ought to be the permanent national capital of the Republic of Texas, and in October of uh, in October of 1839, Lamar and his cabinet journeyed uh, to the the uh, 
new capital of Texas, and by January of 1840, Waterloo slash uh, Austin had all of 836 residents. So Lamar moved the capital of Texas uh, to the frontier to move it away from East Texas supporters of Sam Houston. Lamar also took a different approach toward the Indians as uh, than did Sam Houston. Lamar's attitude was that Texas Indians either had to obey the law, leave the state, or risk execution or extermination at the hands of Texas authorities. And the Cherokees were the first tribe that he targeted largely because of his hatred of Sam Houston. In May of 1839, Texas papers revealed an alleged plot and correspondence between Cherokees and Mexican authorities. And on that basis, when the Cherokees refused to leave Texas peacefully and rejected promises of compensation for their crops, uh, Lamar moved the Texas Army against the Cherokees, and in the Battle of Natchez, N-E-C-H-E-S, the Battle of Natchez, Natchez River over in East Texas, in July, July the 16th, 1839, Texas, the Texas Army defeated several hundred Cherokee under Chief Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S. Chief Bowles was a friend of Sam Houston, and in this Battle of Natchez, Bowles and over 100 warriors were killed, and the rest of the Indians were driven into the, uh, the Cherokees, were driven into the Indian Territory, which we know as Oklahoma. The Comanches, a little bit different. Um, the Comanches were extremely violent, and in late 1839 and in early 1840, uh, the Cherokees scored victories, but given the population of Texas was growing threefold, the Texans, I mean the, uh, the Comanche Indians, soon saw the handwriting on the wall, and they wisely requested a peace council in San Antonio in early 1840. Lamar's government accepted their, their offer of peace with the proviso that if the Comanches came in to, to uh, negotiate peace with the Lamar government, that they would bring all of their white captives um, that they had collected over the years with them. In May, May the 19th of 1840, 65 Comanche Indians arrived to negotiate with Lamar government in San Antonio, but they brought with them only one white captive. When an attempt was made to seize the Comanches as hostages, gun fighting broke out, widespread fighting. 35 of the Indians were killed, 29 captured. A couple escaped. Um, seven Texans were killed and eight wounded in what was called the Council House Fight in San Antonio, the Council House Fight in May of 1840. The Comanches that escaped returned to the frontier and with the news that the Lamar government had uh, violated its uh, offer of peace and had killed a number, killed and captured a number of warriors, and the Comanches on the frontier immediately killed every white hostage that they had in retribution for the, the council house fight. The Comanches then raided Victoria on the Texas coast, sacking the little town of Linville, returning home with their booty um, into the interior of Texas, the Comanches ran into a Texas Ranger force near Lockhart, outside of Austin, and um, in August of 1840, the Texas Rangers killed over 100 Comanche warriors. Two months later, in October of 1840, with the assistance of the Lipen Apaches helping Texas, the Texans attacked and killed over 130 additional Comanches. These campaigns, however, cost Texas two and a half million dollars and greatly added to the public debt. But they did, in fact, open Texas for further Anglo settlement from the United States. Thus, finances under the Lamar government suffered. In three years, his government brought in one million eight. $80,000, but the government expended $4,855,000. Thus, the government uh, was heavily in debt, and the Labar government sought a loan from the United States, but the best it could do was one 
$457,000 loan in the United States. And so uh, Lamar felt that he had to take drastic action. And drastic action was the printing of paper money. When Lamar became president, there was only $800,000 of paper money in the Republic of Texas. And it is estimated that each Texas dollar was worth about 80 to 85 cents compared to a United States dollar. But Congress in 1839, 1840, and 1841 authorized $3.5 million dollars worth of paper money, redbacks, called redbacks. And by November of 1841, a Texas dollar was worth between 12 to 15 cents per American dollar. So the paper of the of Republic of Texas was was uh, paper money was grossly inflated and it was virtually worthless by the time that Mirabeau B. Lamar left, off, uh, left office after three years. The public debt rose from two million, which he inherited from Sam Houston, to over seven million, largely because of the Indian Wars that uh, Lamar uh, committed to. In 1841, at the end of Lamar's term, uh, his supporters backed Vice President David G. Burnett, but the uh, opposition to, to Burnett came in the guise of Sam Houston. Sam Houston had served in the Texas Congress uh, in the three years that Lamar had been president, and he constantly criticized Lamar, and now Lamar versus Burnett in 1841 was a no-brainer. 7,000 915 Texans voted for Houston to only 3,616 for Burnett. So by a two-to-one majority, St. Houston became president once again. Houston's 1842, 1843, and 1844 term of office was, um, was had to be fiscally conservative and um, Many national offices were abolished and clerks were reduced in numbers. Their salaries were reduced. Total expenditures for the next three years of the Republic of Texas was barely more than a half a million dollars. So Houston held down the cost of government for three years to just little over a half a million dollars. He only printed $200,000 additional amounts of, of redbacks because he knew that the, the paper money of Texas was virtually worthless anyway. But he only printed 200000 and held down the entire cost of government for three years to just under, just barely over $500,000. Congress was desperate to find money, and in January of 1843, by, by secret act, Congress authorized the sale of the Texas Navy. But at, an auction was interrupted in Galveston by residents of that city who refused to allow the Texas Navy to be, to remains of the Texas Navy to be sold at public auction. And the Texas Navy was turned over to the U.S. Navy when we were annexed in 1845. But again, anything that, that uh, the Houston, Houston's Republic of Texas could do to raise money, they looked into. Houston's second term, he used a, a, a policy to pacify the Indians, signing treaties with the Waco and to, to, Tawakani, the Tawakani in September of 1843. And in October of 1844, President Houston and Buffalo Hump of the Pinnataka Comanche signed the Treaty of Tehuana Creek, providing for trade and, and friendship between the Republic of Texas and the Comanches. Houston also brought peace to East Texas by ending, by sending 600 militia to East Texas, ending what was called the regulator-moderator conflict that went all the way back to the time when the Spanish and, and, uh, and American officials had signed a treaty that pulled back their forces from East Texas and turned Texas into a very lawless place where outlaws um, outlaws controlled, and Houston brought order 
to what was called the regulator-moderator conflict and uh, brought peace to that area. But by 1844, Dr. Anson Jones, who was the Texas Secretary of State, was perceived as a Houston supporter, although he didn't always support Sam Houston's policies. And opposing, um, opposing Jones would be Vice President Edward Burleson, who was perceived as a Lamar man, although Burleson was quick to deny that he was taking orders from Mirabeau B. Lamar. But Jones and Burleson were the two candidates. Jones won the national election, 7,037 votes, to Burleson's 5,668 votes, with Jones winning very, very strongly in East Texas, which was Houston territory, and Burleson gaining votes uh, the best out west in what was Lamar territory. So uh, uh, Anson Jones became the president of the Republic of Texas and would be, become the last president of the Republic in its years. The Texas population from 1836 to 1847 grew uh, enormously in the time of the Republic of Texas. In 1836, there were only 34,400 Anglos living in Texas, but by 1847, there was 102,000, which is a threefold increase in the Anglo population of Texas. In 1836, there had been five, there was 5,000 slaves, uh, but by 18 47, there were 38,700 slaves, which is a 7.75 increase in the number of slaves. So Anglo-Americans adopted the Southern culture and brought their slaves with them as they came into Texas, no doubt about it. Land was free under for anyone settling in Texas, and under no circumstance was a land grant of less than 320 acres offered to settlers in the Republic of Texas. All told, the Republic of Texas granted 36,876,492 acres of free land to immigrants coming into the, the nation of the Republic of Texas. In addition, under uh, land was granted under the Homestead Act. Land was given to disabled veterans to heirs of those who had died or were wounded in the 1836 Texas Revolution, number of ways that one could own land. And speculators and land companies began to form, uh, such as, um, such as, um, oh, the Alder, Ad, Adelsverein, Adelsverein, excuse me, my German's not good, but the Adelsverein, um, Henry Fisher and Bertrand Miller contracted to settle land between the, 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 the um, Lano and the Colorado River. But before introducing settlers, they sold their grant to the Adelsverine that was organized in Germany in 1842. And immediately the Germans began to send over settlers. And in 1845, the society founded New Brunswick's. Then in 1846, Fredericksburg, and later Sister Dale, Bernie, and Comfort were all established by the Admirals Marine uh, coming to the United States. And so even foreign immigrants uh, entered into Texas during the Republic of Texas. I want to stop at this point and uh, beam this to the clouds, and then we'll start a second lecture here in just a few minutes.